So I want to say thank you all for being here. And again, to explain to those watching on camera, because you may not understand why I'm sitting here like this and why I'm wearing yoga clothes. The answer is I just finished doing yoga and my audience is sitting on the floor. And if I stood over them, they would be looking right up my nostrils. So this is actually a much better way to get me down on the, the level with, with all of my friends here. And I want to talk about something today. And by the way, if you are watching online, I want to go ahead and say, please leave comments and questions. I answer them personally, not an assistant. So please, I, we've been getting a lot of them. It's really cool. So join the conversation, especially if you agree or disagree. We'd like to know about that. Speaking of the internet, that's what's inspired what I want to talk about today. And it's something that happened about three weeks ago that has really just been bubbling inside of me that I just couldn't wait to talk about. So uh, hopefully I won't get too animated for you. Um, I think it all has to do with what's going on in our country again right now. There actually is a thing they are calling campaign stress disorder. They are saying that most of us have it, that we are obsessively checking the news to see how the polls are going, and that most people are convinced that if the other candidate gets in, the world is going to explode. <laughs> This ties into, as we were talking over the last couple of weeks, it's very intentional. To keep you stressed, they keep you engaged. If they keep you engaged, they have the power of your vote. Now, I happen to put a post up on Facebook. I do posts every single day, and uh, thank you to those of you who follow me. It's really great. I'm over like 43,000 followers now on Facebook. And I put one up that I have actually posted before. Sometimes you replay your hits, especially when you're busy, you know, so you just put it up on a different background. And since with Facebook's algorithm, algorithm only 3% of your population ever sees it, then just replay it. So one of the things that I posted before and I reposted this time was people who hurt are themselves hurting. Now, where did that come from for me? It came from a story which many of you know and which I wrote about in my book, A Complaint-Free World. I was preparing a sermon for a church I was working in. This was 10 years ago or more. 10 years ago, actually, exactly 10 years ago. And I was preparing this and I heard this noise outside and I knew what had happened. We lived at this corner right like this and, and going into town it was 25 miles an hour but going out of town it turned 55. And so we were basically on an acceleration deceleration lane of a highway, if you think about it. Well, the sound that I heard was our dog Ginger being hit by a car. And I ran outside and she was in severe pain. She was in really bad shape and it was obvious she wasn't going to make it, but she was still quite conscious. And I didn't see a car. And that's what surprised me. I mean, how did this happen with no car? And I look up the road, headed out of town, and I see a truck driving out of town, pulling a little flatbed trailer behind it, like you'd pull a mower or something like that. And I realized this was the person that had just hit our dog. My daughter was six at the time, and she came pouring out of the house, just in tears, sobbing. This was her dog. Her mother was crying and, and I went insane. I was so, how could someone do something like that? I just flipped out. I, I, I didn't think about my family and the dog. I thought about getting that son of a bitch. <laughs> That's what went through my mind. So I jumped in my car and I went after him. Now the highway is actually gravel there. I looked down and I was doing 83 miles an hour and I thought, my wheels aren't even on the road. If I get killed, it makes it much worse. Well, finally I pull up, the guy gets out of his car and walks up to me. And I screamed, you hit my dog. And he smiled and he said, I know I hit your dog. And then he said, 
something that I couldn't, I, it was almost like a foreign language that someone would say something like that. He said, what are you going to do about it? And I said, what? He said, I know I hit your dog and he poked me in the chest. What are you going to do about it? Somehow, the rage didn't overtake me. I didn't turn into the Incredible Hulk. Mm -hmm. Because again, I thought, if I hit this guy, because he even said it, he said, if you hit me, it's assault. I went back to the house. We gathered Ginger up, we took her to the vet. And we put her down. And that night I lay in bed and I couldn't sleep. I'd never had anybody so blatantly hurt me or in my family so badly. And I couldn't comprehend that someone would do that. And all I could think about was taking a baseball bat to this guy. I'm just being honest with you. I'm just being honest. And I laid in bed all night and didn't sleep. I made it through the next day. I was sure I would fall asleep. But as soon as I did, his smile and poking in my chest came into my mind. I didn't sleep that night either. The third night, I got up and I, I went downstairs and I started journaling. And I thought to myself, somebody who could treat a family pet that way doesn't know the love of a family pet. Someone who could hurt a child like that was probably themselves hurt as a child. And I wrote down in my journal, hurt people are hurting people. They themselves are hurt. So that's the origin of that post that I rehashed that day. And what I find interesting is that it went viral. It got like a thousand, fifteen hundred people looked at it, commented. It was really great. And most of the comments were truth, agreed, yes, wow, thank you, da 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 da. Then there were the ones, nonsense. There are just simply bad people in this world. There are bad people. They came into the world bad. They are bad. And that's that. Now, I thought to myself, based on all the anger that we're even reading in Facebook over this election, that surely that have must have somehow contributed to it. Because if you think about it, with the election, we're supposed to be left with one enduring image of Donald Trump. He's bad. And one enduring image of Hillary Clinton. She's what? She's bad. And we label people. We have labeled people through the centuries based on their gender, or their change of gender, or their skin color, or their religion, or their career, as bad. I have to tell you, when these people started writing this, it made me angry. It showed such a naivete of life. People are not inherently bad, ever. I have a friend in Canada. She has a son. He's a teenager. She can't seem to do much with him. <laughs> of course, she couldn't do much with him when he was 10 years old or 7 years old or 3 years old. And she told me sincerely that she believes her son was born evil. This is a mother. This is a true story. That her son was born evil. 
And I thought, well, you just got off the hook from any kind of good parenting, didn't you? Way to go. If you've got a bad child, what the hell can we expect from you, right? It's laziness. When we label people, it's laziness. And this idea that there are some people who are bad, I forget who said it, but I love this quote. And if you don't remember anything other than this today, let it be this. You're as close to God as the person farthest from your heart. You can talk God and religion and Jesus or Buddha or Muhammad or whatever as much as you want. But if you're drawing some of God's children out of God's circle, there's something wrong with you. And you are not close to God. This idea that some people are bad, bad. Bad means below standards. It means not good enough. It means undesirable. I'm not saying we have to like everybody. I'm not saying we have to agree with everybody. What I am saying is that the moment we label someone, as Wayne Dyer says, we negate them, and we also excuse ourselves from changing our behavior relative to them. Raise your hand if that makes sense. One, two, three. What do you want to say when you see this picture? Everybody do it. Oh, do it loud so everybody can hear you on camera. I'm going to show them this picture, okay? So if there are bad people in this world, right? I mean, if there are truly bad people, bad people, not hurt, not damaged, not messed up people, if there are bad people, then find me the bad baby. There are no bad babies. Hitler was not a bad baby. Charles Manson was not a bad baby. Richard Nixon was not, well, he may have been, <laughs> but you know what I mean. There are no bad people. Eckhart Tolle said it so beautifully. He said, if you would have gone through the life they went through, you would have turned out exactly as they are. So if there's no bad babies, then maybe there's no bad adults. They're just people that we don't happen to agree with. They're people we don't like. They're people that we feel afraid of, either legitimately or for political reasons, we've been made to feel afraid of them. But no one is bad, because if one of them is bad, that means that you could be bad. Anybody want to volunteer and be the bad one? I sure don't. I'm just the one doing the very best I can with what I got. Raise your hand if that's you too. That's it. And the same is true of everyone. Things are far too complex to label people as good or bad. And when we do, labeling people is just laziness on our part. I tried to find out what two very popular spiritual heroes in this country had to say about people being good and people being bad. This is from Jesus Christ. I'm going to read this out loud, then I want your help with it. And I'll tell you why in just a moment. This is from Luke 6.45. The good man, out of the good treasure of his heart, brings forth what is good. And the Evil man out of the evil treasure brings forth what is evil, for his mouth speaks from that which fills his heart. Okay? Let me ask you a question. Was Jesus Christ from the United States? Yes or no? no. Come on, play with me. No. Did he speak English? No. no. Jesus Christ spoke Aramaic. There are 400,000 words in the English language. There were approximately 100,000 words in the Aramaic language. There are literally 100 ways for us to say something for every way, that, or 40 ways for every way that they had. What we know about Aramaic is there is no concept of evil. Human beings put this in when they were writing it from first Aramaic, then into Hebrew, then into German, then into English, okay? So, 
the word evil was substituted four generations down. Jesus Christ never used the word evil. In Aramaic, they didn't have evil. What they had was ripe and unripe. Something was either ripe or it was unripe. The unripe word in this context was translated into the word evil, but it doesn't mean that people are evil. When Jesus said, protect us from that which is evil in, the, in, the, uh, uh, in the, the Lord's prayer, he is saying, protect us from what? That which is unripe. unripe. But isn't something that is unripe, doesn't it have everything it needs within it to ripen? Yes or no? It just hasn't what? Ripened yet. It just hasn't happened. But the moment we say bad, bitch, bastard, asshole, we have negated our need to see that person as just unripe and working towards ripening just like all of us. So I want us to read this together. I'm going to read this one more time, but as you can see, I've substituted the word evil for what Jesus meant, and I want you to say unripe when we get to it, okay? The good man, at, no, let me just read the part. You just say the word unripe. Okay. It'll confuse me. The good man, out of the good treasure of his heart, brings forth what is good, and the unripe man, out of the Unripe. Treasure brings forth what is Unripe. from his mouth speaks from that which fills that his heart. No matter what side you are on politically, the other side just hasn't ripened to your ideas yet. <laughs> There's no reason to hate them. There's no reason to, to, to get angry with friends and family. They just haven't ripened to your point of view yet. Now, they're going to do their best to get you to ripen to theirs. <laughs> just adopt that and you'll find peace. The second thing I want to tell you about whether or not people are bad, and I love this quote from His Holiness, the Dalai Lama. <laughs> people take different roads seeking fulfillment and happiness. Just because they're not on your road doesn't mean they've gotten lost. Isn't that great? People take different roads seeking fulfillment and happiness. Just because they're not on your road doesn't mean they've gotten lost. Immanuel Kant's universal maxim, what kind of world would this be if everybody in it were just like me? And our egos say, I don't know, but I sure as hell want to find out. <laughs> and it's never going to be that way. No matter what you have been told about yourself, you were born good, you were a beautiful baby, and you're still a beautiful baby. You just got bigger skin, <laughs> but you're still a beautiful baby. You were never bad. And as you begin to embrace that other people are damaged, not bad, you develop compassion for yourself and for them as well. <laughs>